and thank you everybody for being on today's webinar where we are going to be talking about fatigue calculations and specifically doing these on strain gauge data. Our agenda today is going to be a brief introduction with our products, followed by getting into different methodologies we have for fatigue analysis. I'll then do a series of demonstrations starting with a, a fairly simple standard fatigue analysis process and then we will begin to add on upon that uh, looking into more advanced features that we can include in our durability analysis and we'll wrap things up with a summary and open things up for questions. For our introduction I would like to just point out uh, some of the brands that we have within HBM Princia. Most of you who are on the call are probably more familiar with the ENCODE brand, being that this is a fatigue seminar. And as such, ENCODE uh, focuses primarily on doing analysis of measured test data as well as EPI results, uh, and then ultimately doing durability analysis on that. One of our other products is Reliasoft. Our other brands is Reliasoft, where we perform more reliability analysis capabilities. Both of these brands available within the HBM Princia product line. However, for today, we will really just be focusing on the one product called Glyphworks within the brand ENCODE. Our objectives for today are going to be learning how we can take measure strain gauge data, perform fatigue calculations on those. Uh, we're going to be looking at a number of different methods, so there's going to be a comparison between these fatigue analysis methods things like stress life and strain life methodologies. And then when we get into some of the advanced topics, we're gonna to talk about how we can look at things like strain measurements from rosettes. We'll talk about material data and how we can bring that into the software. And then we'll also talk about how we can create things like schedules or duty cycles and perform fatigue calculations on those. So let's start with the fatigue analysis methods. And before we get too deep into that, it's probably best that we have a really good understanding of what fatigue is. Now, this may be review for most of you, but it's definitely worth repeating. Fatigue is a failure mechanism. It is a progressive failure mechanism that occurs under repeated or variations in load. What's important here is that uh, the variations in load are really what drives fatigue. If we have a load that is of a constant load, we will not be producing a fatigue failure mechanism. Fatigue can be broken into two different stages. The first stage is the crack initiation stage. And if we continue to subject a part to enough variations in load, we can ultimately take that initiated crack and grow it into the second stage. These cracks will initiate from pre-existing defects. A good example of pre-existing defect would be things like uh, porosity, it could be machining marks, inclusions, uh, typically things that are very small that serve as good nucleation sites for these cracks to initiate. And we're going to uh, now talk about a process that we can use to address fatigue. Uh, so this particular process here is quite generic. It's something that we can apply to our fatigue analysis methodologies whether we're using software or if it's done on uh, with pen and paper. And for today's purposes specifically, talking about measured test data, uh, strain gauge data, we're going to be looking at this process where we have the three inputs on the left. Our geometry in our case today is going to be addressed with something like a fatigue strength reduction factor. It's commonly known as KF going to allow us to account for any kind of notches or sharp radii that we might not have been able to measure with a strain gauge, but we were perhaps able to measure strain near uh, such geometric features. Our loading environment is going to be the actual measured strain gauge data itself. And that's going to contain the, the variations in strain that we see from the variations in load. And then the material properties. These are specifically fatigue material properties, and they are typically going to be characterized in one of a couple of different methods, things like stress life or strain life. All three of those inputs get combined into 
the box in the middle where we perform our fatigue calculations. Here's where we're going to be performing things like um, rainflow cycle counting, which allows us to determine the cyclic content in our loading environment. We're going to apply those cycles to material properties and uh, use things like miner's rule to accumulate the damage as we look through our time series data. And ultimately, we're going to output some type of fatigue result. So that's the general gist of, of our analysis roadmap. Now, as far as the methods go, we have quite a few different methods that we can choose from. Uh, we have the very first bullet item, something that we would call relative damage, um, potential damage. We might also call it uh, pseudo stress life or pseudo SN. This is a means where we can take uh, at a minimum two different events and assuming the same type of simplified fatigue properties like the slope of an SN curve, we can determine which event would be more damaging than the other. And with that kind of comparison, we can compare the two uh, typically in the form of a ratio. Other methodologies, if you're really interested in absolute fatigue terms, it's going to be best to use something like a stress life or a strain life methodology. Those two are going to be modeling the crack initiation stage of fatigue. If necessary, we can use crack growth uh, or uh, in terms of uh, the Glyphworks product, uh, a linear elastic fracture mechanics approach to model the second stage of fatigue. And then we have a couple of specialized variations of fatigue analysis methods where we can do vibration fatigue, essentially being able to perform fatigue, count cycles on things that are vibrating, uh, things that might be described in the frequency domain. And then finally, weld fatigue. Weld fatigue might be a variation of a stress life methodology where we've done some extra things to account for a lot of the things that occur when a structure gets welded, things like a heat affected zone, uh, the irregular geometry that we have in the weld area. And all of that is going to be in an attempt to help us determine when a crack might start and how that crack might grow, kind of like what we see in the image on the right. Just to do a quick comparison, and I'm really only going to focus on a couple of these, if we look at the two rows in this table in the middle, the stress life and also the strain life methodology, these are the two that uh, we'll be focusing on for the remainder of the presentation the two that allow us to generate fatigue results in absolute terms. Historically speaking, stress life is the method that we discovered first. Um, it is the one where you might tend to find the most material data, and those tend to be adva advantages for the stress life methodology. One of the major disadvantages for the stress life methodology is that it doesn't model low cycle fatigue very well. Therefore, if you have a situation where you are experiencing plasticity on a localized scale. Uh, you're seeing cycles large enough that, uh, that you're really starting to, to move into that low cycle region. The stress life methodology is probably not going to be the best approach. Um, one typical use case of stress life methodology, you'll find that there are properties within the glyph that allow you to choose from some of the weld standards. So for example, we see here in the last column, uh, the British weld standards uh, are available from the stress life glyph. Strain life glyph, uh, this is a fatigue methodology that allows us to take into account low cycle fatigue. So it works well for both low and high cycle fatigue. Probably one of the major advantages with that one. Uh, one of the disadvantages might be the fact that uh, there are quite a few more coefficients required to describe the material properties. So there's a little extra complexity associated with it. It's definitely not one that you would consider if you're going to be doing hand calculations, but when it comes to software, uh, maybe that disadvantage isn't uh, as big of a disadvantage uh, after all. Let's talk a little bit about materials. This is a question that often comes up. Uh, ENCODE comes with several material libraries. These are already pre-populated with materials that have stress and strain life fatigue properties in them. Uh, these material libraries are also user-definable. So if 
you have an interest to create your own material library or database, or you want to add materials to an existing one, these are definitely things that you can do. And there's a wide variety of different ways in which we can describe the fatigue properties or fatigue life curves inside of this database. Now, what I would like to do is actually jump over into ENCODE at the moment, and I'm going to actually, uh, well, hang on, let me do one more slide here. I'm going to build for you uh, an example of material inside of a library. It's a question we often get, how do you do it? So it's definitely worth showing. And what I want to do, um, this isn't the only way in which you can do it. However, it's a pretty typical way. I'm going to, in two steps, describe uh, material properties that could ultimately be used for fatigue calculations. And we're going to start by first describing a generic material data set. That's going to contain things like the basic mechanical properties of the material. And then we're going to create a child object of that, where we create an SN material data set, or a stress life material data set. So let's go into the ENCODE environment. And what I'm going to do is on the far left, underneath of the main menu, I'm going to navigate down to Material Manager. This is going to bring me into my material database, where I can choose to create a new material database. So let's just call this Example. We'll hit the OK button. And once we select OK, it's added all of these different possible material definitions that we can use. We now have a branch that has appeared at the top right here. And via a right-click functionality, I can right-click there, select Add Data. And I now get a menu that allows me to choose the type of data I wish to add to my database. So if I scroll down just a little bit, you'll see one of them is called ENCODE Generic Material Data. And we'll just give this a name, call it Generic Material select the OK button. And the next thing that you'll see is a table where we have a number of different properties that as a user we will need to fill out. Only some of these are required. That would be the yellow ones. So I'm going to go ahead and just fill in a couple of these. So we will assign a material type. Uh, I actually have a, a, um, a yield strength, so we can go ahead and complete that in terms of megapascal for this particular material. We have a UTS, which is 600, and we also have a modulus. And these are all the same numbers that we had on the PowerPoint just a moment ago. So now that I'm complete with the required ones, I can select the OK button, and it will create an object for me in that tree titled Generic Material. And if I select it in a table, I can review the values that I had entered. From here, I can right-click on Generic Material and continue to add additional data. So I'm going to add data one more time. And this time what I'm going to do is select an ENCODE SN data set. So I'm going to enter stress life material properties. And it is going to be in the form of a slope and intercept of the stress life equation, uh, plus a couple of extra things. So let's go ahead and select that. And we can give this a name as well. Call it generic SN data set. The basic mechanical properties, they're pre populated already. So now I just move a little bit further down on the table here and begin to populate the remaining required properties. So this first one that I'm typing in is the stress range intercept. This is where the stress life curve would intersect the vertical axis with the units being in units of uh, megapascal and also the cycles being of range. So that's twice the amplitude. Uh, again, I'm just going to give the numbers that we saw in the PowerPoint slide just a moment ago. B1 is going to be the slope of the fatigue curve. We'll type in negative 0.15 there. The fatigue transition points, uh, this is going to be somewhere around a million. So around a million cycles, we can have a transition point. And I can add a secondary fatigue uh, slope if I'd like, and I'm just going to add zero. It's just going to give it a horizontal line. Standard error. This is actually a material property that allows us to describe the scatter of our data points. Uh, if you can imagine, the slope and the intercept most likely came from a regression through a cloud of data points. That cloud of data points came from a number of test specimens. Typical count is somewhere on the order of one to two dozen test specimens. 
And just because of the inherent imperfections in the specimens themselves, the lab equipment, the way in which the test is being conducted, there's always going to be some kind of variability associated with that. So this tends to be a, a non-zero number. And we'll just put in point one to describe the, the scatter or the standard error of that cloud of data points. And lastly, the R ratio is just describing the type of cycle that we use to test our test specimens. We're going to put in a value of negative one, and that is just describing that we have a fully reverse cycle, plus minus the same amount when we were testing those test specimens. And now hit the OK button, and we now have underneath of generic material a child object called generic SN data set. Here we can see those values in a tabular fashion, and we can also plot those graphically. So I can check the tick box here for graph, and we can view the slope and the intercept of our stress life curve that we've just created. We can even look at it with things like uh, a UTS correction, where we have uh, changed the, the uh, last little bit of our fatigue curve. It's uh, something that uh, might commonly be done if you are in, in fact trying to, to use an SN methodology for, for lower, um, lower life uh, cycles. However, in those situations, please remember that is probably a case that's going to be best used for an EN or a strain life uh, methodology. All right, let's go ahead and jump back into our PowerPoint. We're going to continue to the next slide where we're going to start talking about uh, a fairly simple example for fatigue calculations. What I'd like to do is actually build this process for you. And then once these few glyphs are built, we're going to continue to add on to this and, and show how we can do more advanced things with our fatigue calculations. So let's jump back into ENCODE. And I'm going to go to Glyphworks right here on the main menu. And what I'm going to make use of is some time series data. And this time series data is actually from a work example that comes with the install of ENCODE. This is going to be work example number 22 in Glyphworks. And you can see here that we have four different tests, four different time series tests available to us. They all have similar channel content, similar channel numbering. They're all of strain gauge data. And to start with, I'm just going to work with this very first one. Let's drag that out on the workspace. And we can graphically display all five of those channels. And if I maximize this, you'll see that we have almost a minute of measured time series data. Now, what I'm going to do is from the fatigue glyph palette, I'm going to grab the strain life fatigue glyph. And I'm going to also get some display glyphs from the display glyph palette here. Let's go ahead and grab an XY display. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to display in what will be the upper plot the raw strain gauge data. And with that, I will also be displaying damage in the time domain. And we can also grab a couple of other displays. I'm going to grab a histogram display to show the damage histogram as well as the rainflow histogram. And then lastly, we'll grab a metadata display. And this is one that we'll use to create a table. And that's going to be used to show some summary fatigue results. Now, if you'll remember the road process, or the roadmap for fatigue analysis, uh, we need to describe three inputs. We need to describe the material, the geometry, and also the loading. So we've got the loading here. That's good. The remaining ones will be defined as properties inside of the strain life glyph. So I'm going to double click on that glyph and we can now enlarge the property dialog box. You can see that KF, this is my geometry uh, correction factor or my fatigue strength reduction factor, is set to 1 and for the moment I'm just going to leave it at that. And we also have a materials tab and if I click on this it allows me to navigate to a material library that comes with ENCODE and I'm just going to choose the carbon steel that we see here. So at this point I'm ready to run my process. We can click the Run button, and it's going to perform some calculations of fatigue, strain life methodology on those strain gauge channels. And now we have populated all of the display glyphs. 
So the first one I'm going to show you is the metadata display at the bottom. I'm going to fashion this into a table. And what I want to show is just a few pieces of information. I would like to be able to show the channel number. We'll add that below. I'll show the channel title. And then if we scroll a little bit further down, I'm also going to show some fatigue properties, including KF and the name of the material. And then we're going to show two fatigue results, two strain life results. That is going to be life. And then lastly, the total damage, which is just going to be the inverse of life. So now you can see I have created a table. We have a row for each channel that was in the time series data. And we have a column for each piece of metadata we've chosen to display. And this process right here is going to serve as the foundation for all of the advanced features we're going to add on to it in just a moment. Before we leave this one, though, I just want to show a couple of other things. Um, actually, I had forgotten to add my damage column. Let's go back into my metadata display. I must have forgotten to add to tabulate. Grab total damage. There we go. Now we have all the information we're looking for. Okay. If we focus just on this first channel, number 90, the total damage right here, and then we look at the damage in a different way, maybe in the time domain, we can see here is channel 90, strain gauge data, raw data, and then below it, we have damage in the time domain. The summation of all these damage peaks is going to equal the total damage that we see in this box here. The same is true for the damage that we see in the histogram, just as a review. The histogram that we see down below is the rain flow cycle counted histogram. So this is showing us graphically in a 3D plot the characteristics of our cycles. This axis right here is going to be the size of our cycles, the range. And this axis right here is showing us the mean of each of the cycles. Up top, we have a histogram showing us damage. And what we can see is there is perhaps just one single cycle right there and it is responsible for this single column of damage. So that one biggest cycle observed in our time series data has contributed the most of the damage. And then there's some smaller cycles, uh, maybe mid-range cycles right here, and they are responsible for this damage. We did, however, perform these calculations on all the channels, so we can always use these blue arrows here and index through to channel 91, 92, 93, and 94. All right, let's go ahead and jump back into the PowerPoint. And we're going to now go into some of the advanced features for our durability analysis. What are some of the other things that we could potentially do? Um, and we're going to start off by looking at strain rosettes. So strain rosettes are essentially an array of strain gauges um, that are at least two, uh, sometimes three arranged such that we can measure strains in a number of different directions. Uh, it's really helpful when we have complicated loading that are creating these strains that might vary in direction over time. We have two main approaches where we can perform fatigue calculations on strain gauge rosettes. The first one would be where we would calculate a principal stress. So if we've got a strain rosette and we use the strain rosette glyph, we can do all of our more circle calculations. And one of those outputs would be the principal strain. Uh, we can plot that versus time. And once we have that, we can perform T calculations on that time history. Alternatively, we could do something like a critical plane analysis. In this particular example, what we're going to do is resolve strain in a number of different directions. Typically what we will do is we will resolve strains on planes that increment uh, 10 degrees at a time. And you can almost imagine if you had a normal vector, a vector that's normal to your strain rosette, simply rotate about that normal vector 10 degrees at a time each time, calculate a new strain history, and we can then perform fatigue calculations on each of those strain histories. So let's go ahead and jump back into ENCODE and see how we might be able to do this. And what I would like to do is actually copy these glyphs, and I'm gonna create a new workspace for you guys.
and we will call this strain rosette. And I'm going to paste those same glyphs back into this process. Now I need to change a couple of things. I'm going to remove the test from my time series input glyph. And what I'm going to do right now is just grab three channels. I'm going to grab those first three channels, drag them in here. Now, in reality, these three channels are not from a rosette, but for demonstration purposes, we are going to just pretend that these are, in fact, strain gauge channels from a rosette. And we are going to then go to the basic DSP glyph palette, where we can grab the strain rosette glyph. And I'm going to insert that into my process. So let's go ahead and disconnect a couple of pipes. And we will pipe in my string gauge rosette data. And that then is going to go onward to my XY display as well as the strain life glyph. Now we need to describe a couple of properties in this strain rosette glyph. If we go into its properties, one of the things we need to tell it underneath of the advanced tab is which channels are the rosette. So let's go ahead and just type in 90, 91, 92. That is just identifying these three channels right here as the three legs of my rosette. And then on the output channels tab, we can choose to output strain. And what I would like to do first is do a critical plane analysis. So let's just check this critical plane box hit the OK button and run the process. <clears throat> so we've actually processed quite a few channels of strain, 18 in fact. So if I scroll down to the metadata display, you can see that we have now 18 rows of results and the channel titles have been relabeled to illustrate for you which angle we are currently looking at. So you can see here in the channel titles, they are in fact indexing at 10 degree increments. And just like we saw earlier, we have information like properties uh, that we use for our fatigue calculations and results. And if we scan down this total damage column, we can see that somewhere down around here, maybe an angle of 150 degrees relative to the first leg in our rosette, that happens to be the direction that has the most damage. It is the most damaging direction. And what we see in the plots up here are going to be very similar to what we saw earlier. However, what we can index through are the different angles for that particular rosette. So right now we're looking at zero. But if we use the blue arrows, we can see that we're now at 10 degrees, 20, 30, and so on and so forth. Another way in which we can perform these strain rosette calculations is if we already know the angle. And to do that, we just go back into the properties and we can specify a specific angle. In this case, we could say 150. Let's say we already knew ahead of time that this was a dominant direction in terms of strain. We can select the OK button and rerun the process. It will run it just at that specified, that user specified angle and perform all of the fatigue calculations we saw earlier. <clears throat> all right, let's go ahead and uh, we could do one more and that would be, let's, let's do it off of principal strain. So we'll go back into the strain rosette properties and let's check the abs max principle and select the OK button and run it. There we go. And now what we're doing is performing the T calculations at the abs max principal direction, which in this particular example is pretty close to 150 degrees. Um, the life results are ever so slightly different. And what this is suggesting to us is that uh, the life is a little over a thousand repeats and that thousand repeats is of the entire time series event right here. So 7,000 um, minutes, you could say, since this is uh, on the order of about a minute in duration. All right, let's jump back into our PowerPoint. We'll go to the next slide and let's talk a little bit about back calculations. 
what we can do with back calculations and how we can use this to meet a different target life. So what we saw just a moment ago on uh, the very last calculation using the principal stress or principal strain is that we could repeat that time series event a little over a thousand times before we would expect to see a fatigue failure. And in this case, fatigue failure, we should be clear, is going to be crack initiation since we're using a strain life methodology. Now, what happens if you're given new requirements for your design that it has to last longer? It has to, in this case, let's say that it needs to last 14,000 repeats. And one of the things that you could do to address this new target is to reduce the stress or reduce the strains. If you have a method or a way in which you can reduce the stress into a structure, uh, the life is likely going to be longer. So let's go into ENCODE and I want to show you a different mode inside of the strain life clip. So if we go back to the strain life clip here, we have a mode as our first property. And what I want to do is a back calculation based on scale factor. And as soon as I do that, we have some new properties appear inside of the strain life glyph, one of those being target life. So I have a new target life, and we're going to call that 14,000 repeats. And we're going to hit the OK button and then rerun the process. So this is going to run slightly differently now. We're not actually going to populate these displays with fatigue results. Uh, rather, we're doing a, a back calculation, trying to achieve something close to 14,000 repeats. And what we're looking for is a scale factor. And that's a new property that we need to display. So let's go into the metadata display glyph properties here. And underneath of the strain life results, we should have a new property or a new piece of metadata called scale factor. So let's add that to the table. And now what you can see is we have, in fact, calculated a scale factor. We have to have strains that are about 84% of the original strain history that we saw a moment ago to achieve this new life target, to basically extend the life by a factor of two. And if you think about the slope of the fatigue curve and you look at the, the logarithmic uh, uh, relationship we have there, or the exponential relationship, that's going to be... Um, pretty reasonable. So, so it's a really good um, sanity check just to see uh, the reduction that we have due to this scale factor right here. All right, we'll go back into our PowerPoint and continue on to the next advanced topic, and that is going to be addressing things called schedules. Now, every industry, uh, every company might have a slightly different terminology of what a schedule is. Uh, some people call them duty cycles. Some people call them blocks. Essentially what it is, though, is the ability to take a number of different events that you might have measured out in the field or out on a proving ground, bringing each one of those individual events into a process, maybe assigning repeats to those events, and performing fatigue calculations on that entire schedule or duty cycle. Uh, the ultimate goal here is that that entire duty cycle probably has some relationship or some meaning to real life usage. We can address this in a couple of different ways. We can drag multiple files onto the time series input clip, or we can create a schedule file. What I'm going to do for you in the demonstration is actually dragging multiple files directly in time into the time series input clip. So let's go back into ENCODE. And what I'm going to do is grab just the first two glyphs from that first workspace, and I'm going to create yet another workspace just so that we've got a clean slate, a place to work. We will call this schedule. And now I can paste those first two glyphs here. And instead of working with just one test, I'm going to let's go ahead and just remove it, and we will select all four of these time series files. And you can tell just by the naming convention of the files that they are describing a different type of operation of what looks like maybe a piece of construction equipment. So some backfilling, digging, plowing, and then some transport. We will drag all four of those tests into my time series input glyph. 
And I actually need to change a couple of properties so that we are interpreting these results uh, in the manner that we intend to. So let's go to the properties of my time series input glyph. And the first thing that I want to change is I want to treat them as a single test. We are going to take all four of these events. They are going to be concatenated one after another. And to do that, we need to set combine all tests equal to true. And the other thing that I'd like to change, here are those four events under the selected data tab. And I can, as a user, define repeat counts. So we're just going to assign 10 repeats, 20, 10, and 10. We can now hit the OK button. And if I look at this graphically, let me maximize this, you can see that we have 10 repeats of the first event followed by 20 repeats of the second event, 10 repeats of the third, and another 10 repeats of the fourth event. So that is the concatenated string of string gauge data that we're going to be analyzing. And in the strain life clip, we need to change some properties there as well. There's some really nice metadata that comes along with this. It's essentially describing the repeats. And we need to tell the strain life glyph to use those. So the use metadata schedule is going to be set to true. And lastly, what I'm going to do is make use of a data value display. This is just a table. And I'm going to attach it to this last tab right here that's going to show me summary fatigue results, but specifically about the schedule and how those are going to relate to one another. So let's go ahead and hit the Run button. And we will now enlarge this. Actually, I can hit the Maximize button here. It might be quicker. And just to focus in on a little bit, if you look at the first five rows, you'll notice that those are all of channel 90, the very first channel in the test. And in the third column, we have information about the events. So here we can see the amount of damage on channel 90 for backfilling. That's right here. Same thing for the next event, the next one, and the next one. We can perform some math on this, some very simple math, and then determine the amount of damage or the percent damage contributed from each one of those. And what you end up seeing is that this digging event tends to contribute the most to damage. It's 80% on that first string gauge channel. And if we jump down to the next group of channels, number 91, uh, it is 89% in that case, so on and so forth. So uh, very nice information, all summarized in a single table where you can see information about individual events of an entire schedule or a duty cycle. All right, getting close to the end here. Uh, the last advanced feature that I want to talk to you guys about is making use of metadata inside of our fatigue calculations. Everything we've seen so far uh, means or in our strain life glyph where we've assumed a KF or a, a fatigue strength reduction factor of one and a specific material, that has actually been assigned to each one of the channels. And that may not be the way in which the test article was configured. It might be that those strain gauges were all placed on unique materials and they also have unique KS. So what I'd like to show you is how we can make use of a table of information in the spreadsheet. We're going to treat it as a lookup table to bring channel specific information, things like material and KF into our process and assign those pieces of information in the spreadsheet to each channel that we have in our time series data. So let's go ahead and go back into ENCODE. And what I'm going to do for you is jump back to this first worksheet. And I'm actually going to uh, make use of everything that we see here, but I'm also going to bring in my Excel file. So I've already got an Excel file. It's called Material Lookup Table. I'm going to drag that into my process. And I'm going to be making use of this green output path. It's going to be the metadata that comes out. And to do that, I need to merge that into my time series data. So let's go ahead and use a metadata manipulation glyph. And we're going to repipe a couple of things. I'm going to send my time series data here. And then this metadata manipulation glyph allows me to merge the information in my spreadsheet into my channel data. And then we will reconnect these pipes back like this. 
So the first thing we need to do is we need to tell the Excel input glyph which cells in my spreadsheet I need to use. So let's go into the properties there. In the property dialog box for Excel input glyph, we've got a number of different areas where we can define multi-column information. We can define test level metadata and also channel level metadata. What I'd like to do is the channel level metadata. So let's click on this button. That will open up for me my Excel spreadsheet. And here you can see the table that I've created. This table contains three columns. The first one is what allows us to key off of the channel numbers. So we have a column with a title of channel and then numbers associated with the channels in our measured time series data. And then we have two additional columns for material and KF. And there are some unique materials in here as well as unique KFs. I'm just gonna highlight this entire table. It populates the cell information here. And then that information goes into this property dialog box. We'll also need to tell it that this contains multiple channels of information and that we are in fact keying off of the channel number. That's what's in that first column. And we're ready to go there. Lastly, I need to define some information in my strain life glyph. So let's go into the properties here. I no longer want to have a fixed KF with a value of one for each one of my channels. What I'd like to do is assign what we call a piece of metadata to that. And this is just the column heading in that third column in my Excel spreadsheet. And then if I go a little bit further down for a material name, we can do the same thing here. We will just type in the column heading from the spreadsheet and that is gonna be surrounded with hashtags. That's what tells ENCODE that this is a piece of metadata. And now if we hit the OK button and run our process, we should be able to use that unique information in our strain life calculations. And you can see that we have in fact used different KS. And if you look at this list right here for our materials, we have used different materials on different strain gauges, different channels of our test data. So a very convenient, very useful way uh, to take what's probably information that's already sitting in the spreadsheet and bring that into your ENCODE process. All right, we're now getting to the end of our advanced topics. The last one is, is really just to mention again, we saw some of this already, the fatigue results. Not only can we use user-defined metadata like from a spreadsheet as an input into our process, but we can get fatigue results out as metadata as well. Uh, in general, that's gonna be with this green pad. And if you look at this tree structure, there are a lot of different types of metadata that we can bring into our process and display as results. Sometimes it's going to be damage in terms of total damage. Other times it might be damage that's been normalized per hour. And the same thing is going to be true for life and then life in hours as well. All right, so let's go ahead and wrap things up uh, with a summary. And uh, the first thing that I'd like to mention is that there is more information available to you. Uh, everything that we've seen here has been based off of data that is in worked examples that comes with Glyphworks, uh, specifically worked example number 22, but closely related worked examples are going to be number 7 and also number 21. So if you guys have an interest in learning more about this, you can go to those as well. And there are PDF documents that give you step-by-step -step instructions for those. And then finally, to summarize, uh, we have, for our strain gauge-based fatigue analysis, several different methodologies that we can use, uh, most notably the stress life and the strain life methodology. Those can output fatigue results. Uh, we could also do uh, crack growth or relative damage calculations. Uh, you've seen here that the data can be used to calculate fatigue on a single channel or a number of channels. Uh, as well as a number of different tests. We built a schedule earlier, and we can also deal with a variety of different types of gauges. Uh, the first couple of examples, we're assuming that the gauges were uniaxial gauges. And then we brought in the strain life, or the strain rosette glyph, and did some rosette calculations on those gauges as well. And lastly, the results, they can be from a single event. We can describe results 
from multiple events and even how each one of those events in the schedule is contributing to the overall damage. And we can do sensitivity studies on things like scale factor or the KS. 